I am really excited to introduce you guys to Sarah Cabal, who's joining us from New York. Good morning, lunchtime to you. Um, we'll be talking about scaling your business. Um, Sarah is with a company called Butcher Shop. It's a very cool agency out of Silicon Valley. I've been looking at their website. And I think Sarah is in a fantastic position to talk all about how to scale your business. Um, not sure if Daria is going to join us. Um, Daria is the second panelist um, who comes from a company called Bunch AI here in Berlin. I happen to know Daria for a number of years because uh, we used to work at the same accelerator program and dealt a lot with super early stage startups. Um, but let's just kick it off with you, Sarah. Um, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and please introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm the head of strategy and one of the associate partners at Butcher Shop. We are a global brand experience agency working with company leaders all over the world um, to help them turn their big ideas into brands that people love. Um, I'm in an interesting position because as the head of strategy, I work very closely with founders, CEOs, CMOs, growth leaders um, when they're at important inflection points in their company journey um, as they're trying to grow and scale their businesses. And particularly in my role, I try to bring research and discovery into our process whenever we can to help company leaders really ask the right questions and uncover opportunities for how they can differentiate from competitors, articulate what they stand for, and ultimately um, find unique ways for them to tell their stories. Um, so excited to be here and um, excited to share some of the things that I've learned from all of the different types of businesses that we've worked with. Fantastic, thanks, Sarah. And hey, Daria, nice to Hi. see you. Nice to be here. <laughs> We're just starting the introduction rounds. I did a little bit of a, a tiny little curveball because I told the audience that you and I have met before. We spent quite a bit of time together at Startup Bootcamp, and then you guys launched successfully 12 Grapes, which is now Bunch AI, and you've raised some money, but nobody can do it justice. So please, you introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I mean, you've got it basically. I, my background is um, psychology by training, but I'm a founder by, I guess, heart and uh, also um, mind at this point. And I'm currently leading a team that. Um, is 15 people strong and um, we're working with um, the product we're building actually is an AI leadership coach. So we work with a lot of companies and uh, individuals that um, are in like hyperscale environments. So that grow very quickly and therefore are in need of support in actually how to grow their young managers, um, oftentimes in high growth environments. And um, I'm sure you, um, can relate to that. Um, there is not much time to actually learn and grow and expand your toolkit and expand your skill set. So we're basically creating a product that helps to shortcut that um, process a little bit, or at least provides a lot of support. So um, I'm one of three founders on the team, and we are a very kind of remote person, international team, and um, have grown, I think, from eight to, yeah, I think about 15 now this year alone, which may not sound like a lot, but it's definitely a big change for a small team. I think that brings me sort of to, to one of my first questions to you both, because um, we just wrote briefly an email, but Dari, you were saying that, you know, scaling sort of in, in early stage is very different to, you know, scaling for later stage companies. <clears throat> so what I was thinking and, and trying to do a little bit of research, I went back to to read Hoffman's book on on blitz scaling, and maybe you can both tell me a little bit about what you think the differences are when you're scaling a super early stage startup, and sort of the challenges and what you need to look out for. And then, Sarah, I would imagine that you work with sort of more mature companies um, that are not at the seed or early stage phase, but that but that are probably slightly larger. So I'd love to get your perspective. Maybe we start with with early stage. Daria, if you want. Yeah, I think, I mean, in the early stages, it like the work is already kind of scary because you are like three people, five people, seven people, 10 people, 20 people. And like none of this sounds like scale when you think about let's scaling and like LinkedIn size and so on. Um, so, yeah, it was really interesting to have this exchange before, because for everyone who is listening, I actually um, 
was invited to speak. And then at first I, of course, kind of backed off and said, I can't talk about scale. My company is like 15 people. <laughs> what are you talking about? And I think Tanya made a really good point, which is um, going from a small kind of early stage team um, and being very nimble to a team of 15 people is actually also a change in scale in that sense. And that's absolutely true. So to give a few examples on challenges that we're facing currently, um, we have this like really core team at this point. Um, people that have been and wor worked with us for the past three years or yeah, I think three years is the longest. And um, we've been developing a lot of kind of machine learning technology and our product development process has matured a lot. So we've been doing a lot of this kind of like grinding um, and experimenting and kind of really, really sussing out what the value proposition is, what the product is, iterating a lot on it. I think the current solution is actually like our third major iteration with like many, many, many um, iterations in between. So the very kind of typical journey. And I think throughout that time, you kind of start taking things for granted, like alignment, decision-making process. Um, how do you get to plans? How do things actually work on time? Like how does meeting culture look like? What are communication norms and all these things, right? They are just like organically grown and everyone who developed them is kind of with you in the journey. And so it becomes more this like Navy SEALs type of environment where you are just like showing up, doing the job, moving forward and everything is like super implicit. And it's also so beautiful because it's so implicit because you don't actually need to like run behind people and, you know, point things out. But <laughs> as you start hiring, people that are amazing individuals like we did, but that haven't been with us on that journey. Um, we immediately discover that we have a lot of gaps in documentation in how we actually were developing process. It wasn't clear what the norms are. They weren't very explicit. And especially nowadays in age, you can't really expect people to come forward and kind of explicitly clarifying the job is with you as the founder and as the entrepreneur and as the leader of the company or the leader of the team to make these things clear and actually provide an inclusive environment where everyone can immediately kind of get up to speed. And we absolutely were not ready for this. So we're still kind of in this transition period where we are um, catching up on this and like making it all better and, and increasing our documentation and transparency and communication and process. But it definitely was a huge challenge for us to kind of just go from this like super hyperspeed implicit organic flow to like, oh, wait a minute, we actually need to make clear which assumptions we're operating on and so on. So that's probably the early stage challenges by and large, at least from our experience and from my perspective. Yeah, that's fascinating. Cause I think there's, there's probably a difference like, like back to, to, to Reed Hoffman who writes, you know, scaling and an uncertainty is, is sort of more, you know, where you guys were. Whereas Sarah, said, I'd love to know, sorry, my voice, I haven't spoken to anybody all day, which is the weird thing about Corona when you live at home. <laughs> but anyway, um, Sarah, you probably work with different kinds of companies. Um, have you worked with a lot of startups or companies that are still figuring out their product market fit? Or I'm, my hypothesis would be you've got companies that have done that, that have figured it out and that are now sort of more in hyper growth. Uh, we actually work with a wide range of different types of companies at different stages throughout their life cycle. Um, and it's been interesting to see the differences and the nuances between early stage companies and startups and companies who are further along in their life cycle and getting more mature. Um, I do think um, some of the interesting things about working with early stage companies is we're most often working directly with founders who typically are juggling multiple roles, wearing a lot of different hats, and they tend to be responsible for not just running the business, but they're also oftentimes head of marketing, head of customer success, head of product sometimes. Um, and so they, they really do rely on us as a partner to kind of help bring that outside perspective that's gonna help them um, embrace all the different things that they're focused on day to day. With more mature companies, we're typically working with larger teams, which means there's more stakeholders in the mix, more opinions and voices that we're juggling. Um, and sometimes it also means there's more resources, more established processes. Um, but at the same time, there's still challenges that they're facing every day, still a lot of unknown unknowns that they are coming up against in thinking about what their next step is going to be. And so the process does tend to be fairly similar, um, regardless of the size of the company that we're working with. There's still a really important process that we go through um, with companies of any size to really help them figure out 
where they are today, where they want to be in the future, and what are the potential roadblocks that they're going to be running into. So um, it, it has been an interesting experience just to kind of see not just the differences, but more of the similarities that exist. I guess that scaling makes sense at, at all stages, right? So how important do you guys think KPIs are along this journey? I mean, there's obvious KPIs that, that every company, they're slightly different. But I guess my question to both of you is focusing intensely on KPIs and being super driven um, on that process. Is that How important is that in scaling? Maybe I can chime in actually. Um, as I mentioned, we had these kind of like bigger iterations on the problem or like we, we did like three different approaches to the problem with um, a slightly different product setup. And the one we are um, having now is by far the most successful. I mean, it's also, we went from B2B to B2C. So like the scale of numbers changes anyways. But I think um, also what we did differently this time around is we not only spent much, much more time in user research before we actually went into any like building stage, like uncomfortably long time. If you think about this and you already built two products and we had um, one product in the market still, we're generating revenue. And then we embark like this eight people team or seven people team at that time, literally like with everyone involved because the other product was a SaaS that kind of like was more or less flying on its own and into this like open field of user research and kind of really opening up the realm of possibilities to build and find a new approach because we we saw that the approach we were taking with product before kind of was very limited and, and it didn't scale as fast as we wanted to and so on there were like challenges with it um it was really uncomfortable and one of the things that we did because it was so uncomfortable and we already had investor support which by the way when you kind of start from scratch on a whiteboard with like a new uh, perspective on the on the user problem even if the user problem is related to what you were doing before and you already have investors in the boat it's like a whole different animal than like just sitting with three people in the room and you know talking about like how passionate you are about the problem and how to solve it so maybe that's why we also were more structured about it because we also had to report etc um, but I definitely think it really helped us from this beginning point of time to ask ourselves what is our strategy meaning we can't build a product that is like world-class in engagement, retention, and virality, and all of these things at the same time, because we know nothing about it. And we kind of are starting from scratch. So we created this like phased strategy, we called it. And we literally had, or gated strategy, actually, we had like names for the gates, like gate one, gate two, gate three. And we, of course, made bets around how long it takes us to get from gate one to gate two. We were, in some cases, very right, in some cases, very wrong. <laughs> one gate we're still working on like months later but these gates were defined by kpi thresholds so to give you an example we said we want to have a product um that is highly engaging because all our competitors are approaching it also from a b2b perspective and it's like um sell a solution into the hr department and really focus on revenue but not so much on adoption and we were basically coming in and saying we want to create a solution that really people love to use and we actually bring into organizations and users really, really want to have it and they are using it every day. And that's going to be our competitive advantage. And so we said that engagement is kind of our like North Star. We need to reach that first. And we defined it as, I think, um, weekly active users divided by monthly active users. And we did research. We also talked to our investors about it. We kind of like picked one meaningful KPI. And we stuck with this and we defined a thing that we wanted to have a threshold of 50%. So every second person that is like a monthly user actually is also weekly active, which is quite um, ambitious and substantial for a mobile product. Um, but we almost reached it. We are actually in right now at 47%. So it's, it's possible, but it was only possible because we kind of had like three numbers at each gate. And we knew that if we don't pass this, we can't really be busy with like the acquisition yet so much. We can do it on the side, but we can't really pull everyone off engagement work and really focus on acquisition until we laid the foundation. And that really, really helped us, I think. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so 
Sarah, have you, there's a lot of questions, but I have to try to back off. I've, st I've still got mine to go through with you guys, but do you think, what, what do you think are some of the common mistakes um, that startups make scale? What are some of the wrong things that they focus on? Because you, Dari, you figured, you figured it out, right? From what I understand. I would say we do have product market fit, but we are optimizing it. And the stage we're in right now is based on scalable growth mechanics. So we have like three loops that are working like great. And then we still need like at least two more in order to reach our level. So we are kind of in the construction zone on acquisition, uh, basically. But I would say on like engagement retention, we are um, in the top 10% of mobile apps, actually. So I think we achieved that, but definitely many mistakes made. I do want to hear what Sarah has to say. Yeah, to yeah. Yeah, I mean, thinking broadly about this topic, you know, I mentioned earlier about when we work with company founders who are wearing multiple hats, I think sometimes too, what we notice with smaller and early stage companies is that they're very much inside an echo chamber sometimes. And um, I loved what you had to say about user research, because I think not a lot of companies are embracing that. And I think it's incredibly important to get out there and talk to your customers, get feedback, um, also getting outside perspectives from investors or even peers in the industry it doesn't always have to be an agency partner like butcher shop but i think that's one of the most important things that we see in trying to help companies avoid some of the mistakes when they're scaling their business they can get just so immersed in the day-to-day -day. they're living and breathing their brand every day and they get almost too close to it to be able to take a step back and see the big picture um and We've also noticed sometimes, I think, in, in having in-depth conversations with company leaders, we start to identify, I think, some of the fears that they have. And there's a lot of um, scariness around giving up control of something and trusting other people, whether it's hiring more people for their team to take over things that they're responsible for or trusting um, other people other agencies or partners or um, vendors to outsource things that they typically would do in-house. So a lot of times when we're working with companies, um, we're also seeing a, a little bit of an internal struggle with, you know, build versus buy as it relates to everything from, you know, payment infrastructure to um, a, accounting and um, kind of everything in between um, as it relates to, you know, SaaS businesses, for example. And I think that's one of the most important signals when companies are considering kind of their readiness to scale is, are you also ready to, to trust others to kind of bring them onto your team and, and, and put that trust in them to help you grow your business? If I can, if I can actually follow up yeah. on this, I think this is such an important um, topic. And I, I think a lot of founders struggle with this. And I think sometimes we tend to have a, or at least discussions I've witnessed so far tend to be kind of one-sided of, um, let me try, start again. So if you're in the shoes of like the person that does have challenges to give up control, but you also know it's very important for your business, it can sound like the only thing you need to do is to give up control. And like, you need to just work it towards this like feeling where you can actually trust others. That's just half of the deal though, or better, you really need to dig deep on what enables you to really fully trust someone. And I think one of the learnings that I've made too late, or like I wish I would have made earlier, is to really trust your intuition and your own benchmarks for quality on who you want to trust and how good they have to be. And if you notice that the only way you can trust someone is they're like literally the top 1% in the industry and they have to be really like much, much, much better than most people you meet in, the similar, in a similar field or in a similar role, or you really like look for someone who is like super, super young and very driven. And you're really, really looking for someone who is like overly ambitious and very enthusiastic. That's okay. Like while we need to create, I think, inclusive environments and companies and teams, like we, I think we should not forget that as a founder, you do have this in, like anchor inside of you to know what your quality benchmark is on work and also on performance and on ambition. And I think it's really important to be honest with yourself and to really say, um, in order for me to trust, I need to really have like found someone who is really, really good at what they do. That was my case, for instance. And I have compromised a few times too early because we needed to fill a position, like the typical mistake. And then these people didn't last and I couldn't trust them. And it was really difficult for both sides. And I think it would have been much better if I actually just kept going and maybe work with an agency partner who is like really leading in there 
segment and they really know what they're doing. And that's also okay to do that for a while until you actually grow into a maturity level where you can afford the people that you are really seeking. So don't compromise on the quality of work that you need and the people that can give it to you. Which kind of, uh, we're kind of already in there, right? We're talking a little bit about the culture. Um, how do you maintain the culture and, and, and sort of, I get the fear and my son's been a founder of two companies and I realized sort of the anxiety and the, you know, the fear that all founders go through. We've lived it with them, right? Um, but despite of that, how can you create a great culture as you scale the company? I mean, you're both in, in, in the thick of it. Um, Sarah, any thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we we really believe that every company has two main audiences, their external customers and their internal culture. And really thinking about employees and the employee experience is such a huge, important part of branding that a lot of times companies aren't thinking about um, as being um, an output of their brand. And I think with change management in particular, that's a big topic that we're facing often when we're helping companies evolve their brands, um, especially when companies are growing fast. Um, we see a lot of times companies coming to us after they've just gone through a really big hiring push and they've just brought on, you know, they've gone from maybe 50 people to 200 people. And that can be a really intense change, um, both for the new employees and for legacy um, employees who've been with the company for a long time. And so thinking about um, what kind of the core company is and how to maintain um, authenticity to the purpose of why a company exists, I think is really critical to make sure that you have defined and articulated and know how to evangelize um, as you're bringing new people onto the team. Um, our company, Butcher Shop, is also experiencing this ourselves right now. We've just joined forces with a team of digital designers and developers in Mexico, adding about 50 people to our team. Um, and I think we're, we're benefiting from the fact that we've worked with so many companies who've gone through this themselves and kind of seeing um, where things have gone off the rails a bit and merging cultures together. And so we've really put transparency and communication at the forefront to make sure that um, we're being open with everyone about, um, you know, what the future is going to look like and, and how we're all going to get there together. And so I think a lot of times it just comes down to making sure that you have strong values and a strong mission and vision um, as kind of that guiding force for however you're going to move forward. It's kind of that filter that you can always come back to. This is an important point, I agree. Um, and I think most founders don't spend enough time actually thinking or like working towards really um, meaningful and graspable and succinct mission um, that people kind of like mindlessly can immediately catch and understand. And it's really, really hard to do. And like, I think it took us a year or so of iterations and it like in the end of the sprint it also took us about like two or three months of intense work on like not only this project, but like it was substantial time commitment of like the growth team member and me, for instance, sitting in like seven hour kind of sessions of like unpacking and then unpacking and unpacking and then go back to the team and then come back. And like, it's really just like, it's really hard to go to a deep conceptual level, I think, for founders, because we are used to kind of like do this multiple 15 things at the same time and, you know, switching and, and like multitasking is typically like a strength, I think, for early stage founders. And so to really kind of sit yourself down and understand nobody actually like will pay you money for it or it won't show up in your KPI dashboard or it doesn't like raise you a million dollars immediately or whatever, but it will actually lay the foundation of a strong team um, to really understand that mission and make it so that everyone else can understand it and really test it with like users, namely candidates and also your team, I think is something that many, many founders underestimate, including me in the beginning. Since since we have, I would imagine, a 95% female audience, do you, is there a difference in how female founders scale their business or their approach to trust or this this DNA culture uh, to male founders or is that, that a stupid question? Or Sarah? <laughs> I have some thoughts, but I want to hear yours. Yeah, it's it's hard to really pinpoint anything in particular, and and 
and maybe it's it's because we haven't necessarily noticed any significant differences between female founders and male founders. Um, I do think a lot of the experiences can be shared, um, but I'd, I'd love to hear from your perspective, um, kind of like being in that role, if, if there's anything that comes to mind for you. I asked myself the question, so definitely not a stupid question, but like one where we, I myself, like I danced around it for a while, you know, I had these thoughts sometimes. Um, so I have two male co-founders and when we go fundraising, it's always like a very revealing um, study of the state of the world in a way. <laughs> what does the world like think about gender? And as we kind of uh, progress through um, funding rounds, we have like two major ones, um, you, you felt the difference already and every time we kind of like retrospect on it. So after the second fundraising round, we actually sat down and talked about how we like perceived it and we had a few funny interactions with like male VCs and so on. and. I really asked myself the, the question of, um, or I had this thought that I didn't dare to ask to my co-founders, like, do you regret being um, led by a female CEO? Because, well, we do get lower valuation sometimes. We, It's harder to raise money. Like, imagine you would be um, <clears throat> like three men, three white dudes, whatever. Like, it's so much easier and so on. I, I don't think it's true anymore, to be fair, but I think when we raised our first round, which is like 2017, 2018, that was definitely true in Europe, like no comparison. And I do think that because of the societal setup and like because of the biases that we know, it creates a few constraints on female-led companies that don't necessarily exist in male-led companies. But that can also happen with other um, marginalized groups. So like I, I can imagine that people founders struggle with the same. So it's not only like a female thing, I think the fact that you always have kind of like shorter timelines in which you have to present the same KPIs and it always feels like you need to make magic happen. It's kind of like going back to school or like university or whatever, where like you have to have better grades, like land the same job. And um, I definitely think there's it's still out there, like at least in my perception, I can still feel it. And for teams that work with female founders, that definitely means that they have to be like sometimes more resilient and more kind of passion led maybe and mission driven as well to you know put up with it in a way like I don't I yet have to see a female company that kind of like I don't know throws out money for like unnecessary benefits and like isn't intentional about exactly which type of environment they create I think the resourcefulness maybe is something that female led teams kind of have to have because otherwise it's going to be tricky to reach the standards. Amazing. So we've got 10 minutes left. Um, and I do want to get to all the questions that we have in the chat. So I'm going to pick them, the individual ones that go to you guys first. So Sarah, what are your tips for staying organized when you have big projects or a very heavy workload? Asked by Tanita. Thanks for the question, Tanita. That's a great question. Um, I think prioritization is key, being able to sort of tackle the things that are the most difficult on your list first. I think we have a saying here, I don't know if it translates to, to everyone, but eating the frog, um, uh, just trying to um, take care of the things that are maybe the scariest on your to-do list. Um, in terms of big projects too, I think um, giving yourself digestible tasks is great. I mean, I'm typically juggling maybe four to five different projects at a time and the context switching between things can be really difficult, um, which I'm sure many, many people experience as well, especially if you're in a position where you are juggling multiple responsibilities and, um, you know, wearing different hats. Um, but being able to sort of segment your day in a way where you can focus on one thing at a time without distractions and then jumping to the next thing, um, kind of carving out um, times throughout the day when you're focused on on one particular task over the other has been helpful for me at least. I also use my Google Calendar as almost like my to-do list, blocking out um, times throughout the day when I need to remind myself to work on something. Um, but it can be confusing for people on my team when they're trying to schedule meetings with me, seeing that my calendar is almost fully blocked off, which um, tends to need some clarification for what they can book over. I'm, I'm guilty very guilty of doing the exact same thing so <laughs> there's a question for you daria also by tanita what skills do you regard as the most important for someone to be a successful leader hmm. 
question. Thank you for this. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably not answer it like from my perspective, because I do think it's a behavioral, like it's a set of behaviors. That's what how we define leadership at Bunch is the ability to influence yourself and others in a positive way, which means you kind of need to do things for it every day. It's not like a thing that you have or don't have. And we run a survey not so long ago with our user base, actually, what they think are like the top three skills, because we offer a range in the app um that yeah future proof leaders need to have and develop and the number one skill actually surprisingly because it was so clear it's like 57 percent said it uh, was emotional intelligence mm -hmm. before results orientation before managing complexity before being resourcefulness and all the other things so i think emotional intelligence is probably one and the second one actually was um being humble like humility so being able to pull yourself out and question yourself first which I think made me made me very hopeful about the future of the world. Amazing um, question. Do you guys can any of you can you both talk about what it's like um, <clears throat> basically the scale of a business being a working mom that doesn't rely on babysitting beyond kindergarten? Thoughts on time investment. Have you guys uh, so, experienced it? If I may get personal, have you guys, are you working moms? Okay, then no. I'll have to answer that, damn it. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been a single mom and a working mom um, most of my life, actually my, my entire life. Um, and I've managed to, to just try to raise two kids um, and also juggling work. And I think, I think you need to be almost, um, obsessed with maintaining a schedule to keep sanity. I mean, that's helped me out. I think my friends, I was doing my MBA when I was 21 when I um, got pregnant the first time. Um, and I think what helped me through it beyond um, all the kindergarten stuff, which I didn't really have, is just maintaining a rigorous schedule. My friends would laugh and say, oh my God, it must be seven o'clock, Tanya's doing this, yeah? Maybe that helps. Um, Here's another question that goes more into specifics for you, Daria. Um, Gabriella asks, any tips on how to make a proper market research in order to launch a new tech product to the market? Um, she's doing this right now. Yes, many. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> rattle it down and then please um, follow me on uh, Twitter maybe or add me on LinkedIn too so we can I can give you like more links. Um, so I think that's probably uh, hopefully helpful. Um, I think beyond the normal stack of like GV sprints, if you haven't checked that out yet, it's a really good tool for like the early stages um, a, or if you're working with other people, like working with the team, I think it's really good. There is new books from Alex Osterweiler around um, the business model testing, the best book investment of all times. So, like it literally has like 67 ways of how to run business experiments. Like please use all of them. And he also gives like a, good guideline on which one to use when based on how much confidence you have and things like this. Um, something that we just tried on um, at Bunch because when we launched the first iteration, we actually used a, a model or framework from Brian Balfour from Reforge. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's also definitely wor worth checking out. Um, he ha also has a paid course. We kind of got some of the content for free from friends and then we paid for it because it was really worth it. So with that, we were able to get a really good um, kind of default uh, baseline of the product. But in order to take it to like this from the top 10% of like engagement into like top three, which is what we're headed for, where literally like, I don't know, Netflix and Spotify and people like this live, <clears throat> we needed more. And so I found this uh, woman that uh, wrote this book, it's called Game Thinking. And she's in San Francisco and she worked with, um, basically she was on the team of um, creators behind The Sims and Rock Band. And she works with Netflix and Disney and many other like um, Valley-based companies. And she developed an amazing framework to make sure you speak to the right people. And that's kind of like my new thing is I'm walking around and like really preaching, check out this book and check out the woman. Her name is Amy Jo Kim. And she really helped us out so much because we had, um, when we started this like, second like leveling up of the MVP, we had 18,000 users and listening to 18,000 users is extremely hard if like the youngest one is 16 and the oldest one is like 67 and they're all in different parts of the world. And that's what, what was our situation. So my backlog was like, I was exploding basically and I didn't know how to deal with it. And so she really helped us out. And the key word there is 
you really need to understand the psychographics. She creates a really good, um, almost scientific model how to do that and how to get to the hardcore users. Now we have a library of like 30 people that we work with consistently, and this has eased things up so much for us. So I can highly recommend the book. It's called Game Thinking and also following her on Twitter. Hope this is helpful, but please add me on Twitter, at Daria Gutnick, and I'll be able to send you more. Like so many mistakes made. It's a very under-communicated field, I think, and people take it like as to. That is brilliant advice. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. That's exactly, I think, what everyone who's listening here wants to hear. Sarah, any thoughts um, from your side? Have you read the book? I haven't yet, but I've definitely, I'm on Amazon in another tab right now. <laughs> I haven't, but I definitely want to check it out. Um, I mean, as it relates to the question about market research, I mean, that's definitely something that's in my wheelhouse and that I think about every day. Um, but um, we also really try to push ourselves to think outside the box in the way that we approach um, how we use research to uncover insights. And I think one of the ways that we try to get creative with it is thinking of unexpected questions that we can ask. Um, and I, I, again, I think that's one of the great opportunities we have collaborating with company leaders is we're able to understand what they want to understand and validate or assumptions that they want to challenge. And we're able to kind of put a new lens on how we might get at um, uh, peeling back the layers of the onion to get a little bit deeper, double click down into topics that are going to help um, identify new opportunities to move forward. And so we, we always rely on, um, first and foremost, conversations with people, talking to customers, talking to users, um, internal stakeholders, getting as many perspectives as we can, but also um, just getting out in culture and kind of trying to see what's happening out in the world that connects back to businesses. So um, we always try to get as many data points as possible and sort of look at it as a little bit of a, um, an exercise in putting a puzzle together, looking at all the pieces that are out there and, and trying to find different ways that we can um, connect the dots. Thank you guys so much. I don't know when they're going to kick us out. I think our time is up, but I think let's try and go back to some of the most important things that we've learned. Um, I think we started out with, in scaling a company, the dangers of echo chambers. I think we can agree on that. Um, we talked a little bit about the super hyper importance of market research, uh, user research in particular. Um, and that when scaling, I guess one of the biggest challenges is trusting your intuition. Um, and, and trusting others when that process comes, when you need to outsource tasks um, to, to external people. Um, I think also the importance and the core DNA of a company, um, how important it is to evangelize on the core DNA um, relating to you know, the culture as companies scale and, and the teams um, enhanced. And we also have a book to read called Game thinking, and we're going to be using Alex Osterwalder and all of his tips on scaling. It's been an absolute pleasure, ladies. 